Good morning or good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> we do have around the world viewers here, so I guess there may be somebody who's it's the morning. Thanks for uh, coming on tonight, guys. I know uh, there's uh, the the Grass Factor guys are doing their show. I don't want to um, butt in on their on their show at all, but um, this is the only time I could do it uh, until like two weeks from now. So I wanted to get on and get this uh, last paper I had scheduled for this morning, but I was sitting in a dental chair this morning getting some some work done. Um, appreciate you guys uh, asking about that. No, it's good. I have a temp put in for now. I, for those who don't know, I broke a tooth off. I got a temp uh, filling or crown or whatever put in temporarily. And I'm going to get the permanent one put in, I guess, in a week or two. Anyway, it's all good. This will be the last uh, um, podcast for a, a week or two. Next week is the fall free break uh, for my children. So I'll be off all week. And I wanted to get this one out of the way because this was the one I actually wanted to cover uh, what I wanted to do at the end because I didn't want, I didn't want to have a didn't want to be too critical uh, early on I guess and so this this one is I'm a bit more critical of this one I hope you don't take it the wrong way and so on that note um, you know papers and and publications in science are not intended to be published and put on a shelf in the library somewhere where no one reads it um, I know it's easy to say that but. You know, once things are published, generally we move on to the next publication or I'll read it. So there's several in my in my in my library that I've read 10, 20, 30 times, as as many scientists have. There's there's key um, publications we go to, but many of them get stashed away and they never get read again. And that's not the intent of them. The intent is to be used, to be uh, discussed and to be criti criticized, to be critical, to be to build on. So, they, um, you know, if something was done well, we build on it. If something wasn't done well, other scientists can chime in and and and. and the next study or the study after that, we can get better at it or we can improve our methodologies and so forth. And that's how we, that's how we progress is, is by critical reviews of the work and continuing to build up on uh, past work. And so today, uh, there's an article that is published in a high journal and um, that is, um, contrary to, um, some of my standard recommendations being those being, you can read the abstract and get an idea of, you know, wh what sort of management practice you might want to follow. Or you can read the conclusions and kind of get an idea. If that's all you want to do, you can kind of get a grasp of what the, the paper found. This is, uh, in my opinion, not one of those papers. And if, and, if, and if the authors feel differently, and if any author feels any differently about any of the papers that I've covered so far, I'm, I'm open to having my mind changed. And please come on. We'll talk about it. That's sort of the intent is to have a dialogue of the literature in a, in a respectful uh, manner. Um, so please, if... <laughs> you're watching this and you're an author and um, you feel I'm wrong, please come on and, and, and correct me because I've been wrong before. I'll be wrong again. And I'm always open to having my mind changed and corrected if, if there's something that I say that is off or I'm misreading something or miscalculating something or whatever. Okay. So having said all that, this will be the, um, the, one of the last papers I cover. There's several more papers. The problem is there's several, so many good papers I want to cover. I, I can't, uh, I guess I got all infinite amount of time, I guess, for a while, but it, it, I need to go on to another topic with warm season grasses. And so I want to move to warm season grasses as the next topic. But um, for now, this will be the last phosphorus paper on establishment for probably some time. Um, so let's let's uh, get to the paper and, and see what we have. So the name of the, the title of this paper is phosphorus responses vary among cool season turf grasses during establishment from seed. So from the title, you can infer that you're going to see some differences among the amount of phosphorus um, necessary to establish a variety of different cool season grasses, meaning that's not always the same. That's what you can infer. Okay. And that's probably true. Okay. There's some of the results in here are sound. They are solid. Um, others aren't. And we're going to kind of go through there. So as we get started. I'm going to go, this is a relatively short paper. It's only three or four pages. And like I said, I'd like to get out of here in 45 minutes or so and, and, but leave you with enough information to really stop and think about, you know, how this can, um, how critical reviews and critical thinking through papers can um, be valuable to you. Um, so let's get started. The introduction. And I'm sorry, I can't pronounce the author's names. I really apologize for that. I should know how to pronounce these names, but they're, they're, I believe they're Chinese names. Uh, but the, the last names are Chang, I believe it's Jin and Li, and it was published uh, in 2014 in Agronomy Journal, which is a top tier journal in our world. Okay, this is a this is a high quality journal, 
Uh, so let's get started. Phosphorus fertilizer placement in the seed bed during turf grass establishment is shown to speed up ground coverage, thereby reducing the risk of soil runoff. Sold out in Petrobras 2008. Now, I, I wouldn't say that with a great deal of confidence, but it's certainly, I'm not going to argue it, it certainly is the case in some situations. This practice may help to produce pea movement to the water systems because runoff is one of the major carriers of phosphorus in soluble and soluble or sediment form now this is actually the true so um kevin and beth did a, a review i guess 2013 i think this is the review paper i apologize if that's if i'm incorrect on that um where the, a great deal of, of phosphorus that moves off site doesn't leach through as soluble phosphorus or doesn't run off as soluble phosphorus phosphorus likes to bind onto everything okay it's going to bind onto organic matter or soil or aluminum or calcium or it's going to do it's going to bind onto something and what what the general consensus is is that a majority or a large portion of the phosphorus that moves off site moves off site on the soil so if the soil itself runs off that's how a great portion of the phosphorus can move off site leaching of phosphorus can occur runoff of phosphorus in a soluble form can occur but generally it's not the majority of of the, of the source or the the form of um, the movement of phosphorus it's usually on the soil is what they're saying and, and and generally i would i would agree with that the literature supports that state state laws regulate phosphorus fertilizer use to applications during turf grass establishment or in an established lawn with the justification of phosphorus deficiency as shown by a soil test However, no phosphorus recommendation is available based upon turf grass species. So what they're saying is you can apply phosphorus. Uh, you can't apply phosphorus generally during, during, or you can apply phosphorus generally during establishment. You can't really apply it too much in, during on established turf grass unless you have a soil test that confirms the case. Now, I would argue that even the soil test itself, probably for me personally, and as a scientist, it's not enough for me. I want to see something in the turf grass itself before I just look at a number and say, okay, the number's too low. I need to add phosphorus to make the number go up. To me, if the turf grass is not exhibiting a phosphorus deficiency, even if the number is, you know, by stamp some standard low, that's, I wouldn't apply it. It's just that simple. So it's, it's like going to the doctor. If you keep going to the doctor, you keep looking at numbers and keep taking blood tests and keep taking blood pressure and all, doing all these tests and looking at all these numbers and somebody eventually is going to go, well, that number's low. Well, I'm perfectly fine. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with me. Now, if there's something wrong with me and they're trying to diagnose a problem and they're doing these tests to diagnose a problem, and then there's a number that correlates with the problem that you're showing, then that's something. But if, if a perfectly healthy human goes in and some odd number comes up, it's something to be aware of, but it's not something to really drive home and start changing all your diet and changing everything just because some number says it's the case. And it's the same way with turf grass and nutrients. The turf grass will exhibit the deficiency in the nutrients if you know what to look for and if you can confirm that with a soil test that's strong evidence to make an adjustment in your nutrient program not just the number on a soil test that's my position and that's my opinion on things okay let's go to the next the objective so that was the that was basically the introduction basically what they're saying is uh phosphorus can be applied but you need a soil test there's not uh some phosphorus recommendations available for all these different turf grass species and dairy establishment and that's that's the situation so the objective is uh, what they wanted to do was they want the objective of this study was to compare the establishment response of Kentucky bluegrass, perennial ryegrass, tall fescue, creeping bent grass, and I think rough fescue was the other grass to various levels of phosphorus addition to calcareous soil with available phosphorus determined by the Olson method. Okay, so the Olson method is the um, sodium bicarbonate that is generally accepted to be used on high pH soils. Okay, I know Malik 3 can also be used in, in some situations, but that's a typical. Uh, soil extractant for IPH soils. The materials and methods. The study was conducted on turf grass on a on a turf grass research station of Beijing Forest Industry, located in the northern suburban area. Now you can put in these coordinates and find the exact location. But basically, this was conducted the Beijing Forestry in China. That's basically so we're in China. The pH of the soil was seven point eight. Okay, now look here. I just highlighted this in red because I wanted to make a note so I would remember. It says in the total phosphorus. What uh, was con was analyzed uh, uh, in total phosphorus analyzed the the Dick and Tabat Tabat Tabai method whatever 1977 at 0.6 grams per kilogram. Now total phosphorus, total uh, potassium, total iron, total manganese. These are I, I don't know that method. I I don't know exactly if they're actually measuring total phosphorus, but total elements is almost always useless to a soil scientist. 
I, I don't care necessarily about what's total. In other words, I'm not boiling in an acid and trying to extract all the total amount of phosphorus and total because I have that doesn't it's not relative to a horticultural or agricultural commodity or, or plant. What is relative or what is important is the amount that can be correlated to a turf response or how much is likely to become available to a turf to the turf or to the plant during a growing season. There's reserve, there's soluble, there's you know, all these different forms that, you know, that would be available or likely to become available. But total, when every time you say, oh, the total P was this or the total K was that, I don't know if that's actually what they're talking about is total. But anytime you see total, to me, I start to like tune out because the total doesn't tell me much of anything. I want to know how much of that will become soluble or available to the plant in some reasonable time period. Okay. I just, that's just sort of a caveat or a little asterisk. I wanted to make a point of today. Soil available phosphorus was 10.7 and available potassium was 48 by the ammonium acetate method. Okay. So the, the 10.7 is the Olson method in uh, one of the locations. And then in the second site, they had a similar soil test with the, with the phosphorus was 10.3. Okay. So they were dealing with 10.7 and 10.3 on the Olson method of, of these two different soils which is uh, likely a, a low number that would probably show a response to a phosphorus um, in, in this, you know, with that, with that extracted. Phos so here's the treatments. We're going to set, we're setting up the stage here, how, what they did. Phosphorus treatments were 0, 3.75, 11.25, 33.75, 56.25, and 75 kilograms per hectare. So what that is, is, is basically, I'm going to try to do this math quick in my head, is 75, it's one and a half pounds of P, about a pound and a, uh, Tenth, no, pound and a quarter of P, something like that. Um, about three quarters of a pound of P, about a quarter of a pound of P, a tenth of a pound of P, and zero P. Okay. So for all the Americans and, you know, all the normal people, <laughs> I shouldn't say normal, but all the, you know, all the English speaking, common language people, it's, it's zero up to a pound and a half of P. They did applied phosphorus at different rates. And they did it to the soil surface using phosphoric acid and a water solution. There was a question that came up on a, on a, uh, earlier on some uh, forum about can you use phosphoric acid? Yes, you can use phosphoric acid. We use it all the time in science to evenly distribute the phosphorus across the the um, the, the plot. Okay, they did it in this case. Uh, they used a CO2 injection sprayer to spray it across the plot. A week after the phosphorus application, three soil samples were taken from each plot from 0 to 10 centimeter depth using a 2 centimeter diameter soil. So a week after they applied the treatment, they took a soil sample. The soil samples were air dried and, and they extracted it for Olsen. Okay, so that's how they did the, the Olsen, uh, the, the, the influence of phosphorus in the soil after the application of the, of the phosphorus. They did it a week after the application. Uh, here's the, the varieties of turf grass that they use, Midnight and Fighter, Kentucky Blue. They did two cultivars of each species is what they did. I'm going to skip through that because I want to get to the other stuff, which is more important, but I'm, we're going to show that again in a minute. They, they measured the establishment by digital images. So they did a double, they, the digital pictures were analyzed using a software package, uh, ImageJ, which as you've heard me speak before, I like ImageJ. Um, I have no issue with that at all. I, I actually would prefer that more people use ImageJ. It's a free software program. A little bit, uh, it's not really user-friendly. There's a lot of uh, um, add-ons or, or um, custom things that people have done to it over the years, and you can change things. But if you want to figure out the mechanics of it, it's, it's, it's useful. And the percentage of green turf grass coverage within the image was calculated following the methods by Richardson, which is a standard method that people have been using to determine the percent green or percent coverage of, it, of the turf grass. So they're using digital images. They're not using subjective um, measurements. They did shoot and root samples as well. Uh, they just uh, ground them and they measured them for phosphorus. And they, they did some density ratings as well. Okay. So the results in discussion. Okay. Um, well, let me real quick, let me just check the chat, make sure I'm good on chat and nobody's asking me for something um, that I don't mean to uh, uh, avoid anybody here. Um, oh, <laughs> yeah. Deep dives on tooth turf grass will knock a tooth out. Yeah, I knocked my tooth out for you, you guys that know about it. Um, I'm so impressed with you, Dave Mayotte. I mean, I'm so impressed. Like, you guys really enjoy talking. I mean, after my, after this little thing here, there's another turf uh, uh, program, the, the, uh, um, the uh um, i lost my train of thought the um uh thirsty thursday guys so you want to go over and watch them as soon as you're done here please please do that um 
Yeah, so okay, I'm good. All right, so this results in discussion. Soil available phosphorus at both experiment sites increased in response to the applied phosphorus and ranged from 10 to 30 milligrams per kilogram, which are considered as low and high, respectively, for, according to Bob Carroll's book, I guess. So what they're saying is they applied phosphorus at increasing rates, and the increasing rates resulted in increasing soil phosphorus when it was extracted. Very simple. Okay? Nothing wrong there. And I'm going to show you that, actually. Where was that? I thought there was a table. No, oh, there's no table of the of the increase. Um, oh, it's up here in the in the figure, right here. I'm sorry, so we can see it on the screen. Yeah, so right here, this figure shows phosphorus application from zero to uh, the highest was 75, two different years, and the soil available Olson phosphorus. So I don't I don't like this soil available or available word. It's a little too skittish as for soil scientists. I, I can't say it's available. Just say it's extractable. <laughs> Say extractable Olson, Olson phosphorus, extractable phosphorus, or whatever you want to call it. But it's to say it's available is a little, I'm not comfortable all the time with that word, but I'm, I, I get what they're saying. I got it. Uh, it's on the y axis. And what you can see is the phosphorus goes from around 10 uh, parts per million at zero applications of phosphorus. And, it's, and it goes up as you get to 75, uh, the highest rate, 75 in both, both years was, was very similar. Okay. Notice that you're applying um 75 kilograms so that's um where's my calculator is that a pound and a half pound and a half of phosphorus and so a pound and a half of phosphorus per thousand square feet times 43 is 64 pounds per acre which if you do some people just use this quick i'm going to show you why this doesn't work but some people use some quick math and say okay divide pounds per acre by two which is true to get parts per million and you apply 32 parts per million of phosphorus but look, the, the parts per million didn't go up 32. It only went from 10 to uh, 25 and 30. So it didn't. you're never going to get into a soil solution or extract in or the, extract in the amount that you think you're putting in. So if you think it's, I'm at five parts per million, I need to get to 10 parts per million. So I want to add in, well, let me do a different one. Five parts per million, I want to go to 20 parts per million. So I need to add in 15 parts per million of, say, K. So I need to add 30 pounds per acre of K. It doesn't always work that way, guys. So be careful when you when you're running math like that. They're, the soil likes to take its share. Microbes like to take their share. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So we so we got to the soil K. The soil K went. Uh, the soil phosphorus went up when we increased phosphorus. No problem. Okay. Now when we get to the results of the ground cover, so establishment. This is what the paper says. Turf grass response for us for phosphorus responses vary among cool season turf grasses during establishment. So I want to know how does the phosphorus rate change the establishment rate of these various turf grasses? Okay. Now I'm gonna cheat. I'm gonna cheat with everybody and make this real simple to understand. I'm gonna skip all the way down to the conclusions, and I'm gonna read one sentence. It says, in conclusion. The use of phosphorus application to promote quick ground cover, so establishment, during the establishment of cool season turf grasses from seed is justified. Okay? Remember that sentence. Write it down, chisel it in stone. Okay? <laughs> this is not accurate. And I want to make sure it's clear. If I, what I've told you in the past, you can go to the conclusions and you can kind of get an idea what happened. In this case, you cannot. In conclusion, the use of phosphorus application to promote quick ground cover during, during the establishment of cool season turf grasses from seed is justified. That's what they concluded. I'm going to show you how that is not true. All right. Let's go back up here to these tables. And I've, hi I've, I've highlighted these in a specific order so that it makes it a little more clear to you all because there's a lot of numbers on the screen. I know they're small. Okay. Let me see if now. Yeah, okay. That's about as high uh, that was about as large as I can make them. On this table two, this is the days required to reach 50% ground cover for all these different turf grasses on this in the first site where the Olsen, the Olsen is 10.7. The table three is the exact same table. It's just for the different site where the Olsen was 10.3. So one was in August of 2012. The other one was in May of 2013. All right. In the green, you will find all the, everything that's in green are the turf grasses or cultivars where phosphorus had no influence whatsoever on establishment. 
perennial, all the perennial ryegrasses, so emerald, emerald and accent two perennial ryegrasses in both years, the phosphorus had zero influence on its establishment rate. Whether it was from one, in other words, from zero, not applying any, all the way up to a pound and a half, the, the establishment rate up to 50% ground cover did not change when we applied all the phosphorus. Tall fescue, the arid three didn't change in either year. Yeah, either soil, nothing affected it. The phosphorus did not affect it. Red fescue maxima, the green here, did not affect it. You see all these A's? That means the application of phosphorus and the increasing rates of phosphorus had no impact on the establishment rate up to the 50% ground cover with our measuring. Same thing with the, the red fescue boreal in 2013. Creeping bent grass, the T1 creeping bent grass in 2013. You can see all the greens. So we're going to count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten cultivars of five species, so, so ten, ten grasses. Of those ten, ten ratings, so the ten ratings in the first year, ten ratings in the second year, we see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve green columns. So twenty out of twenty, twelve did nothing. Okay. It's going to get worse. Okay. It's going to get, but you have to read these things critically. You have to really get into some of the, this is unfortunate in this case. You really have to get into these data and really see what happened because the conclusion doesn't, is not supported by the results. 12 did nothing. Well, what happened with the other eight, Travis? Well, maybe one of the other eight did something. Okay. Or whatever. Okay. No problem. Let's look at it. When you see the yellows, so there's two yellows, the tall fescue Alamo and the red fescue Boreal in 2012. Let's look at the tall fescue and the, the Alamo um, cultivar. We see 33 uh, days to cut 50% cover when nothing happened. We see 30 days to 50% cover when we applied a pound and a half, and these are statistically the same. We did see a, a, a reduction in days when we applied uh, I guess that's a tenth of a pound or a quarter of a pound of phosphorus. We did see a reduction, but as we applied more and more phosphorus, that reduction vanished. In other words, there's no difference between the high rate of phosphorus and no phosphorus. There was only a difference in applying just a little bit of phosphorus. That's where you saw the benefit. Okay. So there's a little benefit there on the, when you apply a little, same thing with Boreal. You'll see the A here in 39. You'll see an A here in 38. There was no difference between the high rate and nothing. There was only a slight uh, reduction when we applied a tiny bit of phosphorus. Okay. So the yellows are where you see a little bit of change with a little bit of phosphorus and no change when there was a lot of phosphorus. Okay. Now let's get to, let's, let's get to the, um, let's go to the dark red one here on the bottom left, Kentucky bluegrass midnight two. Kentucky bluegrass midnight two in 2013 actually gained days. It required more days as you increase the phosphorus. It went from 39 with no phosphorus to 37, which was statistically the same, to 40, to 42, to 45. As you increase phosphorus, you increase the rate of establishment. Or I'm sorry, you increase the days to 50% ground cover. So you're making it, you're slowing it down apparently is what you're doing. Okay. When you get to the light pinks here, I want to, there's four light pinks, the Kentucky bluegrasses in 2012, the creeping bent grass seaside two in 2012 and the creeping bent grass seaside two in 2013. So the same cultivar in both years. And then the Kentucky bluegrasses in the first year, you will see a reduction. Okay. It goes from 53 days on the, we're talking at midnight two here, the cultivar midnight two in Kentucky blue required 53 days with no phosphorus, 49 days with a, with a pound and a half of phosphorus, 43 days for, for fighter tall fescue and 39 or 40 days as you increase the phosphorus to from zero to one and a half pounds. Okay. I'm gonna, there's a similar trend here. I'm going to get to it. 43 days with creeping bent grass seaside in 2012, 43 days with no phosphorus, 40 days with a pound and a half of phosphorus. Okay. 39 days with just a little bit. So, and then, uh, in the seaside in the next year, we see 28 and a half days with no phosphorus and 24 and a half days with a pound and a half of phosphorus. So what these light pink ones are so showing you is there was a reduction statistically. There's no doubt. I'm not asking, I'm not questioning whether or not there's a statistical reduction. It went A to B or A to C to D. It went down. 
But biologically speaking, this is insignificant. You're talking about a three-day benefit on a 40-day grow-in, 40-day 40 40 50% ground cover. It took you 43 days to get to 50% if you did nothing. If you applied a pound and a half, it took, only took 40 days. You gained, you, it was three days out of 43 days that you reduced that time. Now, if you're sitting out there on those plots at 40 days, where the pound and a half grew in on this seaside too, at 40 days you're sitting out there, and you're looking at the pound and a half plot, and then you're looking net right next to it at the control plot, you're not going to biologic, biologically speaking, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between those plots. You're talking about a difference between 50% coverage and 48 or 49% coverage. Okay. Maybe 40, 45% coverage from the, from the control. You're not going to biologically, practically speaking, be able to tell the difference between these. So the pink ones are what is statistically significant, but biologically insignificant. You're not going to be able to tell the difference in my opinion. You're gaining two or three days on a 53-day grow-in or a 43-day grow-in from the control. In this case, you're gaining three days or four days on a 28-and-a-half-day grow-in on the seaside in 2013. So think about it practically, guys. You're standing out there. I'm going to gain two or three days. Well, let's see how much it costs. So you're going to go out there and you're going to apply a pound and a half of nitrogen in the case of seaside to get a three day. Oh, yes, you can just apply this if you want to. But let's say, let's take the high rate just to, just to argue my point. Uh, you're going to... You're going to, you're going to, let's see if I, da, da, da. yeah, you're going to, let's say you apply a pound and a half of phosphorus and, um, let's see if I can do this. So you're going to go, you're going to apply a pound and a half of phosphorus to get a three day additional days, or maybe you can pick the, you can pick the rate, whatever you want to pick and you can do the math the same way. Let's go to the internet. If you go to index Mundi, which is a tiny screen, I'm really, really sorry. I, let's see if I can go over here. There we go. You go to Index Mooney Commodities. This is where you can find the uh, various commodity prices of products. Go to fertilizers. Go to triple superphosphate. You will find in June of 2023, the cost of triple superphosphate was $390 a ton. I got a bug flying in here. $390 a ton, or metric ton. $390 a metric ton. You can do the math real quick. A metric ton is 2,200 2, pounds. The phosphorus in that metric ton is in a triple superphosphate is 45 percent. so you're going to multiply that by 40.45 you're going to come up with 990 pounds of phosphate uh, of, of p205 in 22 in a metric ton of that p205 only 44 percent is actually p so you're going to come up with 435 pounds of phosphorus in a metric ton that costs 390 pounds or 390 dollars so just divide that by 390 dollars and you're going to come up with a dollar and 10 cents or 11 cents per pound of so per pound and you're going to apply a pound and a half per thousand square feet so you're going to apply so let's store that pound and a half per thousand square feet times say 43 so it's going to be that's 64 dollars and 50 64 sorry that's a pound and a half you're going to apply 64 50 per acre that's what that's how many pounds of um uh that you're going to apply per acre and then you're going to multiply that. So it's basically 70 bucks. So it's, it's say it's somewhere between somewhere around 70 bucks, something like that, an acre to apply. Let's go back to the PDF to apply the product that gains you three days. So if you want to apply, if you want to put out uh, 60 or $70 an acre worth of a product that gains you three days, when I'm saying biologically, I doubt you'll ever be able to actually see that when you're, if you're actually standing out on the plots, looking at it then that's, that's what you would get. The only one in, from, in, from, well, on their paper, statistically, that showed a difference and, in my opinion, biologically showed a difference was creeping bent grass T1 in 2012. We're talking about 47 days of grow-in or of 50% uh, establishment versus 39 days. So that's a week. It's eight days if you applied a pound and a half, okay? Or even if you applied 3.75, you're seeing you're gaining a week out of 47 so that's probably biologically significant, okay? But it's definitely statistically significant. But there's a, there's there are times when things are statistically significant but biologically insignificant. There are times when things are statistically insignificant but biologically significant. We have to we have to 
there's a there's a science and an art to some degree in this, as I guess is what I'm saying. We have to look at things in a practical manner. Oh, I'm gonna you know, I'm gonna go and apply sixty dollars or pick change the rate to whatever. You know, apply ten dollars, five dollar, whatever the number is per acre to gain three days. When I'm when I I'm convinced that if you're out there looking at, it, you'll never be able to see the difference. Maybe a trained turf professional, maybe you all will be able to tell the difference, but the average homeowner probably isn't going to be able to tell the difference between 50% grow in when it's 47 days versus 44 days or whatever. Okay. So this is why I have a, an ax to grind. I guess you want to call it that. I have an issue with this conclusion. The use of phosphorus is justified. How? How is it justified when clearly, no question, 12 of the 20 did nothing? So we need to contextual, we need to frame the conclusions to be within the boundaries of the results. That's a key, that's a critical component of scientific writing, and that wasn't done in this case, unfortunately. Okay. If it would have said is justified on creeping bent grass, uh, or it, it was it was found to be justified on creeping bent grass during the first year, but not the second year, because here it is in the second year right down here, and it's, it didn't right down here. Let's see if I can draw on this. I've been doing this lately. I don't know if I can do it right here. Okay. It was it it wasn't. Uh, so I can change that. Yeah, I'm screwing things up. Right here, it wasn't significant the second year, but it was the first year. So say it that way. See, it might not be consistent year to year, but we did find there was a significant and bio, statistically significant or biologically significant uh, uh, benefit the first year, but not the second year. But you can't just say all turf grass. That's what it says. Is what you can read that, and that's what it's saying. Ground cover during the establishment of cool season turf grasses. I mean, so all cool season turf grasses, you should be applying phosphorus is justified during establishment. I'm not buying it, guys. I'm not buying it. Their, their own data, in my opinion, their own data refutes that claim, refutes that conclusion. Okay. So let's go down and see if there's anything else that might have might have occurred that I'm missing. Okay. Um, just so and this is an error. I think they I think this is just a typo. I'm not going to argue typos. Um, it says here in 2013 study the D50 of fighter Kentucky bluegrass, which is this one here, and Seaside 2, which is this one here, showed showed responses. So they're, they're saying that this is a response. See, none of the other ones showed responses. But I think that's a typo because I think what they meant to say was midnight too because this showed a difference, but fighter didn't, and they said fighter down here did. I, I think that's just a, a, a editorial or grammatical error. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, that happens sometimes, but you can see in the data that, that, you know, that wasn't the case. It was the other cultivar Kentucky bluegrass that they're referring to, but just be mindful. You got to, sometimes you got to read through these things. Okay. Um, just a few more things and I'll wrap this thing up. So I, I'm, I, you know, you guys probably get a, uh, probably can tell by now I'm not a real big, um, chase numbers guy. I, I, I'm not a real big hardcore science guy. I'm a more practical person. When you're talking about shoot densities, they measured shoot densities and they want to see the difference in shoot densities among these cultivars as phosphorus increases. I'm not real big in shoot density or root density or root growth unless you can convince me somehow that the end user is interested in that. Okay, is, is our, are our clientele really interested in roots? If they are, then so be it. If they, can, if they even know what the phrase shoot density even means, I'd be surprised. But if they're interested in that, then okay, no problem. But I'm not overly concerned about shoot density per se. Um, establishment rate, establishment cover, yes, during grow in, that's that's important. Shoot density can be important, um, but in this case, I'm not overly concerned about it. Now, in in this on these graphs, what you'll see is shoot density on the y-axis on these graphs here on the left, and then you'll see shoot dry weight on on the right graphs. And the take home message basically is as phosphorus increases above this 11 number, I remember they applied it at like I think it was. That's like a quarter pound of P. So this is this number right here where it says 10 is a really around a quarter pound of phosphorus per pound or uh, per uh, thousand square feet. You don't really see much benefit. You see these lines are all uh, pretty. Let me see if I can shorten. The, these these lines are all pretty flat. And they kind of even kind of go down as we increase the phosphorus. There's a little bit of an increase when you get up into the, to the three quarter pound P rate, but for the most part. The benefit of the shoot density occurred from zero to about a quarter pound of phosphorus. And then after that, these lines are mostly straight or even decline. Okay. The shoot dry weight, again, 
There was one or two cultivars that had a little bit of an increase, but for the most part, once you get to about a quarter pound of phosphorus, they're all flat. All these lines are pretty much flat across the board. You're not gaining much from increasingly applying more and more phosphorus if you're looking at shoot dry weight or shoot density, okay? Keep that in mind. Okay. And uh, so just a couple highlighted points in the shoot uh, density and the dry weight uh, paragraphs that they, they wrote. Shoot densities as expressed in shoot number per square meter increased to a peak and then decreased as the P application rate increased. So it kind of went up a little bit and then it started going down. Biomass, now we're talking about turf grass shoot dry weight. Biomass yield from this study put the critical Olson P levels. So they're using um, biomass as a critical level, as a, as a metric to, de to determine Olson uh, phosphorus critical levels, which is common in agriculture, in, in row crops and in, in these things. I'm, you have to pick some metric in turf. I mean, you can pick turf dry weight if you want. I'm not, uh, that wouldn't be my first one. I'll say that. It would be turf quality or color or something. It would be something, you know, uh, that the homeowner or the superintendent or the member or the owner is interested in. Um, so, you know, shoot dry weight and the yield of basically, I, I'm not sure that that's the first one I would go to, but you know, it happens. And they, they put the Olson P levels between 19 and 22 and 22 and 25 for tall fescue and perennial ryegrass. And so you can see these two ranges don't really overlap too much, 19 to 22, and then it goes 22 to 25. So this is just an, a little bit of uh, information that the, species the critical ranges for phosphorus um can be different for species okay and, and this is a little bit of evidence to support that um anyway i wouldn't particularly use shoot dry weight but it is clearly shown that you know the turf, turf species change the critical values now these are two uh, the last four similar graphs and we're going to wrap this thing up real quick are the root specific weights and the shoot phosphorus contents but again you don't see much change you see a little bit, actually you don't even see that, you see a little bit of increase here in the shoot phosphorus concentration from zero to a quarter pound of P. Not, not much, it goes from 0.4 to 0.45%, but really not a whole lot of change. And then it's just flat. These are all basically just flat. There's a little bit of increase here in some of the cultivars, but not much. So if there is something we can pull out of this, this paper that's beneficial, <laughs> it is that if you're going to see some benefit, it's probably going to occur with just a little bit of phosphorus, a tenth of a pound to maybe a quarter pound per, um, per thousand square feet. You might see some benefit, but increasing um, applying more and more phosphorus, even on this low phosphorus soil, didn't result in a beneficial response in almost any metric that they measured. Okay. Root specific weight was not affected by P application rates and the range tested. So the root specific weights were not affected is what they're saying. It's real simple. They didn't affect the roots. In both years, shoot phosphorus content was in the sufficient range. So for all treatments, including the control. So even on this low phosphorus soil, even when they didn't apply phosphorus, the, the no phosphorus treatment still had sufficient phosphorus in the tissue according to the, the existing range of sufficiency, if you want to call it that. I, I would argue that I don't even know what the, the, the sufficient range really is of t turf grass tissue phosphorus, but nevertheless. Um, okay, we're coming, coming down to the end, and I'll go back to the chat and see if there's anything that you guys want me to address. Okay, so again, in conclusion, the use of phosphorus application to promote quick ground cover during establishment of cool season turf grasses from seed is justified. I would be okay with that if they just said is justified on creeping bent, T1 keep creeping bent in some years but not others, or is not consistent but did occur in one year, however you want to frame it. But you need to contextualize that and frame it. Um, you can't just say this. This is not accurate. Okay, to achieve this goal, a reliable soil test method and the responses from different species and cultivars are needed to achieve the shortest days to 50 percent grow in in the calicara soils in this study the recommended soil olson phosphorus is 20 parts per million for the kentucky blue 15 for uh i'm sorry for creeping bent 15 for kentucky blue 12 for olson and so forth um, seasonal factors may influence phosphorus recommendations because turf grass establishment with warmer soils temperatures may vary less be application okay definitely da, da, da. Um, so basically what they're saying is there's going to be, there's likely going to be different critical values for soil phosphorus based upon the, the species, probably even based upon the temperature. I didn't publish this, this data, but I have found similar results when it comes to tissue analysis, tissue analysis, very in some instances, greatly, um, based upon the season. And they almost always vary greatly based upon the species and they can even vary greatly depending upon the cultivar within a species. So I haven't published that yet. Um, so take it for what it is. It's just my opinion at this point until I publish it. But 
Um, I did find some, something similar when it comes to tissue analysis. So it doesn't shock me when they say the critical levels of phosphorus in the soil will vary by species and seasons and so forth. That's kind of what they're saying there, guys. So um, let me go back to me here and read through the chat and we will um, wrap this thing up and you guys can get over and watch the grass factor. Um, let me just read some of the questions. Im method said they only Im images weekly, then regressed a curve to estimate where where any given plot surpassed 50 degrees. Yeah, could be a source of error. Yeah, so uh, what Carl, um, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your last name, Carl Shiminti. Sh Sh I'm sorry, I'm, I'm butchering your last name. I really apologize for that. Um, but if you take a point every week, and then you regress it. What I think what you're saying is, is at some point there's a source of error because there's you don't know what's going to happen between two points. You usually will draw a straight line. Um, sometimes we'll model it and we'll have a curved line. But we, we're we're guessing basically what happens between points. You have to have a point, and and you and you cut that in half, then you can say it again and cut that in half, and it's an infinite regress to where you'll never actually have every single point on the line. Um, but yes, from if I take a, a rating here at one week one and a rating here at week two, there could be error. Um, at some point it has to be a practical rating. If you did it every day, then, you know, maybe that's too much time. I, I don't know, but it, that can be the case. Generally speaking, I'll say this, when we're doing ratings on grow ins, a once a week rating is considered acceptable to, to be able to determine the, the movement and the change over time. If you wanted to do it every day, I'm, I'm, I don't think anybody's going to turn that down. It's just, um, it's, you know, generally one once a week is accepted by most turf grass scientists. And that's my opinion, but other they can have their opinion if they if they differ. Um uh Looney asks, were there any papers that discussed if phosphorus or compost could help with establishment when water can't be properly provided? Looney, that that basically accounts for probably ninety nine percent of the state of Kentucky. <laughs> there there's not much irrigation in home lawns in Kentucky. There are in the newer newer areas, but my lawn has no irrigation. Um, so are there any papers without any irrigation, yeah, without any water? I imagine there probably are. I haven't come across them yet. Um, how would phosphorus and compost help when there's no irrigation? It's an interesting, interesting question. I'll do what I can to f see if I can find a paper on that. I know there was some work done um, on compost in Florida. There still is work being done on compost on Florida in home lawns. It's not even on a field plot. They're actually doing a lot of work in home lawns uh, around the villages or they have been for many years. Uh, maybe they've maybe maybe they've published something. I'll look. I'll try to see what I can do and look that up. Um, last last comment, unless there's one more. Dave says, Dave, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I can't pronounce your names. I feel bad. Mayote, I think is your last name. I'm, I'm really sorry. It's not my intent to mispronounce anybody's name. But um, this was my wonder: if applying phosphorus would strengthen root mass or depth even if it took longer to achieve coverage that could be worth it the results of the study don't show that benefit either yeah so i'll say this um i can go back to the roots if you want but i've said this before on other other streams is that there are clearly cases where applications of nutrients influence root um dynamics whether it's root mass or length or you know, branching or whatever the case is that it, it can occur but generally, it's it's not com it's not common to see a lot of changes in root masses. And I know we see these photos on Twitter and they, all these people holding up these roots. And you see a slide at a presentation, you'll see this massive amount of roots next to no roots or whatever from some some company or whatever. And then that's all that all may be true. Um, but when we when we properly account for everything and properly balance as much as we can, at least we try pro properly balance as many errors and variables as we can to look at just this one thing. It's it's not all that common to see differences in roots. It's more common to see that there's not, nothing really happened too much. Too much. You have to understand we're in we're in, we're in agriculture. There's a lot of variation in the soil. There's a lot of error we have to account for, and uh, we may there may be differences, but the lack of differences we find were probably a result of um, the strength of our study. If we repped it out eight, ten, twenty times, or whatever, maybe we could, you know. Um, get the precision down to where we could see those differences statistically, but we just generally don't see a whole lot of that. Okay. Um, yeah. Meaning deeper roots would be, would need le less irrigation. It's possible. I mean, clearly there's cases where phosphorus, even potassium has influenced uh, roots in some studies. There's, there's no question. Um, but when you see, um, I'll just say when you see someone say on a, in a national meeting, um, you know, or a marketing meeting, oh, you're going to gain 50% um, root mass or 50% deeper roots. 
just ask, okay, how, how do you know that? Or what evidence do you have to support that? And if it's anything other than a published paper, it's just opinion. Even if it's from me, if, if I did a study and I didn't publish it and I said, you know, company XYZ has a product that re results in um, 200% deeper roots. If I don't publish that, it's just my opinion. Now, my opinion as a scientist and a specialist in this area might mean more than someone else's opinion who's not a specialist in that area, but it's still just an opinion. Another scientist might have another opinion, but until we publish it, does it actually become sound evidence, solid, you know, strong evidence? Once it publishes, now we can discuss it. Like this paper, I'm being very critical of this paper, but they published it. Now it's in the it's in the scientific um, realm, and we can discuss it. We, I can challenge it. They can come back and explain where I'm wrong which I encourage them to do. If I am wrong, please come on and we'll talk about it and explain what I'm missing, you know, and, and I'd like to learn if I'm wrong. I, I want to know that. I don't want to be so, showing information that's, or saying information that's not true. So um, that's what it's there for. So um, don't take too much into someone saying you're going to increase your roots with this product or you're going to increase your roots by verticutting or, or airifying or whatever the case is. It may be, I'm not saying it's not true. I'm just saying have some healthy skepticism about that. And if they can show you some evidence in a published paper, then start you can start to build confidence that that's probably true. Okay, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up. Thanks so much for showing up. Eleven people is uh, on, you guys are doing great. And how how good uh, was was Dr. Braun the other night? I mean, uh, other morning we got him at eight a.m. in the morning, and that guy is a stud. That guy's awesome. I mean, he had, we had the most we ever had was when Dr. Braun was on at eight in the morning. And you guys were great. So. I really appreciate him coming on and you guys partic participating so much. It means a lot to me, as I've said before. I will be off all next week. I will be back on on Monday. Um, it'll be a week or so. So I, I'm going to switch gears. It'll be Monday the 9th, it looks like, October 9th. So it'll be a while. I think I'm going to go back into warm season um, established or fall, fall applications of potassium and nitrogen for a warm season color. I'm not 100% sure on that yet. Um, uh, but that's probably where we're going to end up going as when, when I come back in a week or so guys. So thank you for all showing up, hang up, do a, do a, 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 a what do they call it? A, a, a um, bomb or whatever you want to call it in the, into the grass factor show over on their, on their channel. Just everybody hang up with me and go over and watch them. Thanks a lot, guys. See you later. Have a good one. Bye.